Welcome back to our virtual celebration of Easter on the Farm 2021 at the Pennsylvania German Cultural Heritage Center at Kutztown University. In this next portion of our programming, we will be paying homage to the revered barn historian and dear friend of the Heritage Center, Robert F. Ensminger, known by his friends and colleagues as Bob, who passed away just before the holidays on December 13th, 2020 at the age of 93. Many of us, whether we know it or not, have been influenced by the life and work of Bob Ensminger, the Mid-Atlantic region's leading advocate for the research and preservation of historic Pennsylvania barns. Bob wrote the groundbreaking study, The Pennsylvania Barn, its origin, evolution, and distribution in North America. Bob traveled throughout the United States and the world to discover the European origins of the Pennsylvania barn in Switzerland, its distribution in the Midwestern US, as well as parallels in Germany, England, Scandinavia, Slovenia, and countless other places. Today, we will be honoring Bob by showing his presentation entitled The Search for the Origins of the Pennsylvania Barn. We'll journey with Bob through the rural Pennsylvania landscape and into remote Alpine communities to trace the origins of this iconic cultural treasure. My name is Bob Ensminger, and I've been studying barns in Europe and America for over 35 years. In this program, we're going to look at a very specific type of barn, the Pennsylvania barn. We're going to examine it, describe it, look at its form and function, look at its location, distribution, and range, and we will consider ideas about its origin and evolution. In other words, what is it, where is it, why is it where it is, and where did it come from? We're looking at a typical Pennsylvania barn in northern uh, Lehigh County, Pennsylvania. 1871 barn that was a standard type barn, which means that the gable end of the barn has a very balanced configuration. Now what makes this a Pennsylvania barn is the fact that the stable wall, which you can see uh, beneath the upper front part of the barn, has been recessed back under the front part of the barn. Uh, the recess is about five or six feet deep. It protects the stable doors. The floor above, which extends to the fore, which is the fore bay, that's F-O-R-E-B-O-Y, fore bay of the barn, sometimes called the Vorschuss in Pennsylvania German, or the Vorlaub, or the Vorschutz in, in, in High German, is the distinctive part of the Pennsylvania barn. It's a diagnostic feature of the Pennsylvania barn. So this barn has two levels, a stable level below and a storage level above. The four bay is part of the second story or the storage level for hay and straw. That's accessed in the back by way of a ramp, which we'll see a little bit later. Here's a close-up of the stable door and the, and the barnyard. You can see the double doors typical in Germany and Switzerland and sometimes in England. They allow you to open the top and not open the bottom which provides extra ventilation and light, especially in summer, but keeps the cattle confined to the stable. Above that, you can see the overshoot, the projection forward, the bay to the fore, the fore bay, which again is the diagnostic feature of this barn. If it's a two-level barn with a fore bay along the front or a stable side and has a bank in the back or is built into a bank, it is a Pennsylvania barn. Those are the qualifications that are required to die, define this particular structure. Now we're on the back side of the barn. Usually the front side of the barn is the forebay side and the back side of the barn is the back side. We're looking at a bank of rather long barn. This is the, the D-Long barn, which is also in Berks County, Pennsylvania. Has two large doors for wagons to enter to bring in loads of hay and straw and two tiny doors in the large doors, sometimes called wicket doors, so that people can enter without opening the large doors. Uh, the upper part of the barn has several sections. The two wagon doors form wagon bays, and the three other sections on either side of the wagon doors are storage bays, or hay mows, or straw mows. This barn was built in 1804, and unfortunately was blown down in a rare tornado in 1998, which came through Berks County and did quite a bit of damage. Let's enter the large stable doors. 
We are now inside on the threshing floor. We're looking to the right and seeing the hay mow loaded with bales of hay. You can also see a very massive heavy timber frame section called a bent with a diagonal brace which is strengthens the bent and a double tie beam above that. The tie beam, the upper tie beam, supports the roof truss, which in turn supports in turn supports the roof. We've gone to the front of the wagon bay in a barn and we're looking at this little door off to the right. That little door is is up over the fore bay. We've actually projected out over the stable below and in that if you enter that door you can see bins of feed grains, so that's the granary. The typical place for the granary in older Pennsylvania barns is in the front section of the upper level, actually on, in the forebay of the barn. And from here the grain can be downloaded through holes or chutes and be taken down to the stable below to feed the cattle. So these are feed grains. These grains are not usually f used for milling for people. Here's a good side view of an early type Pennsylvania barn. What makes this an earlier type is that the roof slope to the front is much longer than the rear roof slope, giving you an asymmetrical gable end configuration or pattern. It looks like it's top heavy or front heavy. Actually, it was built this way from the beginning, although it looks like it may have been put on there uh, after the fact. That wooden forebay was built on top of beams which extend back into the barn all the way to the back wall and they're cantilevered and supported in that manner. So this configuration is sometimes called a Schweitzer barn, or a classic Schweitzer in stone, the earliest kind of Pennsylvania barn, which was built from the middle 17 into the early 1800s and later. This barn is in the village of Oley, Berks County, Pennsylvania. This next barn is again a standard type barn, the most common type of barn in which the stable wall appears to be recessed to, to produce the forebay. Notice the forebay front wall, which is rather tall in this barn because this is a later barn, has a balanced gable configuration. You can see several doors in the forebay front wall. And there are doors that lead into the threshing floors. This barn therefore has a double threshing floor. And then windows on either side are windows which probably illuminate a, a granary in that forebay part of the barn. There's also a stairway leading from the forebay down to the stable floor, which is an easy way to get feed grains down to the stables below. About 10% of all Pennsylvania barns have stairways into the forebay, and we may see that same feature later when we go to Europe. Also, you can see a nice barnyard wall, which is the yard in which the cattle can roam around the front of the barn. It's also a place where the haystack may be piled up, or where manure can be produced. It's a fertilizer factory. Pennsylvania barns have been built in Pennsylvania for 250 or more years. In fact, they're still being built today. This example was built in the late 1980s of cement block foundation, a frame upper section, second floor. It's built into the bank and it has posts to support the forebay, which you can see there. It's a posted forebay standard barn. That is near Lenhartsville in Berks County, Pennsylvania. Well, what do we have here? Looks like a Quonset hut on a cement block foundation, but the Quonset hut was allowed to project over the front stable wall and was then supported by posts. So that's a strange looking, very late Pennsylvania style barn. Built in the, 18, built in the 1980s. In fact, when I questioned the owner, he said his name was Torkowski. And therein lies the answer. This is a Polish Pennsylvania barn. And uh, I wondered, well, why, he, why did he do this? He was Polish. His wife came to the scene. She was a typical Welsh built Pennsylvania German gal. He said, I was born just down the valley. And when my husband built this barn, I made him put a forebay on it. So thus we have a Quonset hut, cement block, support post, and a Polish Pennsylvania barn, the Torkowski barn in Eastern Berks County, Pennsylvania. Where do you find Pennsylvania barns? Most of them are in the eastern United States. We can see this map of northeastern section of the United States from Pennsylvania on west. The dark shaded section in eastern Pennsylvania is the core of the Pennsylvania barn region. 
The barns here are the oldest and the densest in their distribution. They date back to maybe the middle 1700s. Beyond the core, a shaded section projects into western Pennsylvania and down the Shenandoah Valley into Virginia, which is known as the Domain. Pennsylvania barns predominate here, where they make up 60% or more of all barns. Notice that an extension of the domain indicated by the cross hatching goes into western Pennsylvania. The form of the Pennsylvania barn thus extends almost to the Ohio line. Beyond these points are several islands in various states. The islands in Ohio and northern Ontario, then across into Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Iowa are all smaller collections of barns numbering at least 75 barns in a county-sized area. There are also individual dots which represent sightings of Pennsylvania barns with one or more barns at each site. I have visited practically every siding in every island, even though many of these were given to me by other barn surrogates. These are people I have looking for barns. I've checked most of them out to verify their accuracy. So we see this broad distribution of Pennsylvania barns from the eastern part of Pennsylvania and West New Jersey across into Nebraska. We're going to examine some of the barns in this broad distribution. This is the Held Barn, which is located in Calvert Cliffs, Maryland, on the Chesapeake Bay, south of Annapolis, virtually at sea level. We are starting at sea level on the east coast of North America. This barn was built in the 1880s. We're coming down the Shenandoah Valley, and south of Winchester, Virginia, is a typical standard Pennsylvania barn with a stone foundation for the basement level and a frame superstructure. You can even see the barnyard wall around that barn. It's a typical Pennsylvania barn and made of limestone, which is exactly the same stone as the Great Valley farther to the north in Pennsylvania. And you can see how this valley directed traffic and settlement to the southwest. In the, early, so in the early 1800s. The valley extends south through Shenandoah and Rockingham County into the central part of the valley, south of Roanoke, and that's where the barns begin to thin out. I recognize this barn from the interstate traveling south. It has an asymmetrical gable end, and it's a rather small barn, and it therefore could be a log structure. I did not get into that barn but we'll look at log barns a little bit later. They actually continue and extend south into eastern Tennessee near Knoxville, where an Amish settlement in the 1850s and 60s produced a number of Pennsylvania barns, at least one or two, oh, at least one or two are still standing. Well, here's kind of an oddball. We see the bank bridge leading up to the second level of the barn, and we see the overshoot or the forebay is actually on the, the gable side of the barn. I like to ask people where they think this barn is located. And they immediately spot that Amish buggy and they say it must be Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. But as you probably know, the Amish have settled all over the eastern part of America. And this is in western New York State in Cataractus County near Jamestown. And the Amish have been moving into the area from Carroll County, Ohio for the last 50 years. So this is a rather late barn, probably early 20th century barn. If you look at the wall above the gable forebay, you see a line across there separating the boards, a seam of boards. That seam marks the location of the tie beam, which has been dropped down from the eaves. That former configuration is usually a sign of a later type of a barn frame. Let's swing north and go to Canada in Black Creek Pioneer Village, north of Toronto, is a very large log Pennsylvania Schweitzer barn. We can see the cantlevered forebay kind of hanging on the front, although we know it's been built on that way. The frame section to the rear was an add-on, it's later, so you have to take that away. But this barn is almost 100 feet long. It consists of two large log crib constructions on either end and a large double-wide threshing floor. Oddly enough, it was built in 1809 by a man named Schmidt who came from Pennsylvania using old-growth large white pine logs for the foundation and the log crib walls. It's an extremely unusually large barn, and it's kept in good condition by the park people. 
several miles to the west in Kitchener, Ontario, was a large settlement of Amish Mennonite people who came out of Pennsylvania around the time of the War of 1812. So there's a nice island of Pennsylvania barns in southern Ontario. This is the Bricker Barn, one of those barns. It is a very deep posted forebay to support it, built about 1844. We're inside the Bricker Barn, and now we can see the form of the barn bent, or the framing inside the barn. And you can notice that in the distance, the upper tie beam reaches an end post near the opening of the door, but does not go quite to the top of the post, forming kind of an H bent. This type of bent was easy to arrange or assemble lying down on the barn floor and then could be stood up as the barn was raised. So barn raisings can occur with bents in which the tie beam goes into the end post but below the top of the post, which means it can be conveniently stood up and the barn can then be completed. Earlier barns had to have the bents erected piece by piece, the old medieval way, which took a lot longer. If you look above the tie beam on this barn bent, you can see an, an angled post reaching up to the, the roof of the barn. That's called a, a queen post. And a queen post supports the long uh, longitudinal beam known as the uh, purlin, which supports the rafters. That is the most common type of construction in Pennsylvania barns, say from the early to middle 1800s and right across the country into Canada. Well, here we have a nice farm scene. There's a Looks like a nice Pennsylvania house off in the distance, and there is a standard Pennsylvania barn. You can see the open four bay at the right side of the barn in a nice cornfield. That barn is near Lancaster, Lancaster, Ohio, that is. Kind of tricky because the people who settled Lancaster, Ohio, came out of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, around the 1790s and built another island of Pennsylvania barns on west. So wherever Pennsylvania people outmigrated into the Midwest, and down the Shenandoah Valley, they carried their technology and their barn style with them. And you can trace these barns, therefore, right across the United States, which is what we're doing right now. This is a close-up of a barn near Lancaster, Ohio, the Howdy Shell Barn, built in the 1840s. Notice again that the stable wall is recessed. The four-bay front wall is very tall. This has a balanced gable. It's a typical standard Pennsylvania barn by far the most common type of barn built of this style. We're just a little bit to the west of this near Ashland, Ohio, and actually near Jeromesville, Ohio, looking at the Miller barn. A slight difference here is that the stable front wall is now made of frame. It seems as barns were built through time, they used less and less stone, maybe because of the expense. But again, on this barn, you can see the nice four bay beams coming out underneath the barn to support the four bay and four bay front wall above. Going into western Ohio, we have this unusual barn in Allen and Putnam County, the Neuenschwander barn near Bluffton, Ohio, another Amish Mennonite settlement area beginning in the 1840s or 50s. The weird part about this barn is that it has a four bay, but there's also a rear bay overhang in the back side of the barn. It's a multiple overhang Pennsylvania barn. There are clusters of, the, clusters of these in various parts of, of America, some in western Ohio, some in eastern Ohio, and some down the Shenandoah Valley. This Neuenschwander barn was built in the 1840s. Continuing west on old Route 40, the National Highway, we cross into Indiana, and lo and behold, near Pennsville, Indiana, sounds almost like Pennsylvania, is the old Troyer barn which is again a fall frame standard Pennsylvania barn. Swinging across Indiana to northern Indiana in LaGrange County, another Amish Mennonite outpost, where today there may be 75 or more Pennsylvania barns still remaining intact, although they're disappearing fast because of suburban development. This one was built in the 1870s. We're looking in one of the barns in that neighborhood and we're seeing the, the framing bent on the inside of the barn, which is, has been simplified. There are not quite as many braces, but it's still very strong. It certainly has held up this barn for 150 years. And here very clearly we can see the canted queen post resting on top of the tie beam and the purlin, which supports the, which supports the roof rafters, your most common type of roof truss. 
Swinging north of the boundary into southern Michigan are a number of Pennsylvania barns like this one. It is a posted four bay support and a gambrel roof. The roof has two planes of slope, probably meaning it's a later barn, built after 1900. Either it's a later barn or it was an, a later barn frame built on an old, bar, an old barn foundation. Into northern Illinois in Stephenson County, another Pennsylvania settlement area, which was settled in the 1840s and 50s. Here, ago, here again we have a standard Pennsylvania barn. This is my trick question. I ask people where this barn might be located. And those people who have studied Pennsylvania barns might say, those stone columns are just like the ones you see in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where the four bays supported by stone column posts, conical stone column posts. However, this barn is in southwestern Wisconsin, near New Diggings in Lafayette County. And it was built in the 1850s by a rich farmer who was also a miner. This is a zinc mining area, and he built himself a show barn. He might have gotten the idea for this Chester County, Pennsylvania type barn out of the farm journals of the day, which were publishing a lot of material about barns as they spread across country. A little to the north in Milwaukee, just north of Milwaukee, is this standard Pennsylvania barn built in the 1880s. And if we go to the north central part of Wisconsin, we come to Marathon County which today has a population of large dairy barns with posted four bays. These were built all after 1900, and they represent the largest group of barns built that late in the United States. They're used as dairy barns and were probably promoted by local barn builders. We're continuing across. We cross the Mississippi River, and we are now in eastern Iowa. And this barn was built probably in the later 1800s in eastern Iowa in an in Amish Mennonite community near Kelowna, Iowa. If you travel old Route 36, the old Pony Express route from St. Joseph to Hannibal, or from Hannibal to St. Joseph traveling west, you'll get to northwestern Missouri in Holt County. And along that axis of settlement, there are several Pennsylvania barns, like this one you see in the picture. And if you cross the river into northeastern Kansas, in, into Donovan County, you find another small cluster, including this, maybe the earliest barn in, in, in the state, which is a, law, a, a frame Schweitzer barn, which was built in the 1860s. The post supports were added later. There are some barns in, in central and eastern Nebraska, but at this point we get away from general farming and mixed farming and go into ranching and wheat raising. There's no need for large multiple purpose Pennsylvania barns, so the barns disappear until you move far enough west to reach a humid climate again like that in northern central Oregon. This is in the Willamette Valley near Aurora, Oregon. It's the Ivan Krupp barn, built in the 1880s. As you can see, it's a standard Pennsylvania barn and was built by Mennonite descendants who had come out of Canada on their way west to Oregon in the 1860s and 70s. The westernmost Pennsylvania barn that's in its original location is this one. Now we're looking east towards some mountains and in the shade of the clouds is Mount Baker, which is a snow-capped peak. So we're west of Mount Baker and almost to Puget Sound, near Acme, Washington. This barn was built in 1908 by Bud Ambrose, whose grandfather had come here from Illinois, where he probably saw Pennsylvania barns in place there. But this is the westernmost known Pennsylvania barn on, built on its location, excepting for a few that have been carried west and rebuilt later as houses. Well, here we have a bank barn. We can see the bank bridge at the back of the barn. There doesn't appear to be a four bay. In fact, there is no four bay in this barn. So you enter the stable instead by going in the gable wall, the sliding door you can see, and going down a central nave or a central aisle with cattle on either side. This style of basement barn with a bank, I call it a, no a northern basement barn. They're found all the way from western New England across upstate New York, where this one is located, and on into Canada, and on west as far as Minnesota. They were dairy barns, built in the middle and later 1800s. 
These are not Pennsylvania barns, even though, even though they are banked structures. Bank barns can be found in many parts of the world, including this one in southern uh, Quebec, in Canada. Here we have a gable bank configuration. Another bank barn, log structure. I said barns can be built in many parts of America and in, in many parts of Europe as well. This nice log bank barn is found in, nor in southern Norway. We're back to Pennsylvania, and here we have a barn that is not banked or built into a bank. It's built basically at ground level. It's called a Grunscher or ground barn. It probably is the earliest type of Pennsylvania barn built by the early Pennsylvania German settlers, probably in the early part of the, of the 1700s, just after they arrived here. This Grunscher or ground barn is still a multiple purpose barn, small but ideal for pioneer farming farmers who were subsistence farmers. We see a central threshing floor and then a doorway on either side leading to a stable. So this ground barn has a stable, a threshing floor, and a stable. And above each stable the logs are up, set apart which allowed ventilation because there are hay mows or straw mows up there. So this barn could handle cattle, could handle threshing, a threshing floor, could house a wagon, and could also have hay storage, so it was a very small multiple purpose barn, ideally suited for the technology of the Pennsylvania frontier. And these were built from the early 1700s on into the early 1800s. The earliest ones were log, but they were made of stone and frame later on. This is in Berks County, Pennsylvania. Not far away in Berks County, in the famous Oley Valley, is another ground barn. You can see a ground level barn, not a two level barn. There is no four bay. There is a central threshing floor. The large red doors show that. And then on either side we have a stone part of the barn which contains a horse stable on one side and a cow stable on the other side. A unique feature of this barn is a little shed like pent roof above the one stable. And you can see the studs for the pent roof on the opposite side too, although that one has been removed. This is the Casper Mall barn, built in 1791. From first appearance, this appears to be a ground level barn. There is no bank on this barn and there is no forebay of the barn. It has a nice steep medieval roof, however. So let's check around and look at the other end of this barn. There we see that the opposite gable end is actually below ground level, so this has half a basement. This is a half basement ground barn, of which there are a number in Pennsylvania. Now some of the early scientists and scholars who looked at this barn figured that this is a stage in the development of the Pennsylvania barn. They knew that the ground barn was the earliest barn and the four bay barn was later. So they theorized that at some stage the ground barn began to grow a basement. So here, here we have a half basement ground barn. They later theorized that this barn, which is a bank barn as you can see, was a, a next step in the evolution of the Pennsylvania barn. But if you go to the front end of that, there is no forebay on this barn. So they figured the sequence was ground barn to half basement ground barn to full basement bank barn without forebay. Rather, this barn probably had a pent roof at one time. And rather than be a stage in the evolution of the barn, it probably represents an example of an English Lake District bank barn which also came to Pennsylvania in the middle 1800s. So I tend to reject the idea of the evolution of the barn through stages because there are too many true four-bay barns which date back earlier than these later phases in the so-called stages of evolution. We see here a nice cantlevered Schweitzer four-bay bank barn. Four bay extends about eight feet beyond the stable wall, is unsupported. That's the configuration of an early barn. But there are no openings in the side of the barn. We're going to see why in the next picture. Because this is a log crib barn, now we have a log crib barn, which is a bank barn which has a four bay. This is the earliest form of the Pennsylvania barn. I call it a log Schweitzer. We're looking into the threshing floor or wagon floor or tractor floor of this barn and we can see on either side of the floor are 
sections of large log cribs. Some of the logs have been cut out. Those are loading openings so that in olden times you could drive your wagon into the barn and, load, un, and unload hay or straw directly into the log cribs and pile the, stra the straw or the hay in those sections, those storage sections. And above the tractor you can see some beams directly above the threshing floor or the Dreshden as it's called in German and that is called the Oberden or the Upper Den the upper threshing floor, which is a place where sheaves can be stored uh, before being dropped down to be threshed, usually during the winter season of the year. How do you date a barn? Well, it's difficult and it's very tricky because date stones have sometimes been recycled. The date stone in this barn is 1744. This is the Peter Wentz barn in southern Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. Here it is, and as you can see, it's a stone barn, which raises a suspicion. Stone barns in Pennsylvania were rare, rarely as early as 1744. There may have been some stone ground barns that earlier, that early, and maybe that's exactly what this originally was because it's been extensively rebuilt. You can see the forebay is not nearly deep enough. The balance of the gable is not consistent with an early Schweitzer barn, and the stonework near the top of the uh, eve of the barn shows changes, which may mean that this barn was enlarged at some point. In fact, it was completely rebuilt about 50 years ago by a, a man named John Milner, who is an architect. It may not have been a four-bay barn to begin with. So that date of 18, 1744 is probably much too early for the earliest example of a Pennsylvania barn. However, this barn, which was built in 1747 and documented in the newspaper of 1915 Reading Eagle at that time was called the oldest barn in Berks County, 1747. It is a log structure and there you see we have a true log forebay on this barn. So the forebay on a barn in Pennsylvania appeared rather early, appeared a lot earlier than some of the ideas that people have had about it evolve and gradually through time into the later 1700s. Four bay barns were already there by the middle 1700s, as you can see in this picture. A magnificent medieval looking building is the Isaac Long Barn in Lancaster County. Notice the very steep medieval roof and the very shallow four bay front wall. It's a large classic stone Schweitzer four bay bank barn. On this early doorway and the lintel of the doorway is the date of 1754. Johannes Long and Anna Long. Johannes Long or John Long built this barn, or at least started to build the barn in the 1750s, 1754. It may not have been completed then, but when it was, it was like the one we saw in the previous picture. So this may be the earliest dated barn in eastern Pennsylvania. We're in the upper part of the Pennsylvania barn at the Isaac Long farm. And we can see this massive roof truss. It looks like the bottom of a boat, the framing of the hull of a boat. Actually, that's a very early type of Germanic framing called the Liegendustuhl truss, which is found in many early Pennsylvania houses and barns and usually is a sign of an early building. So that truss is consistent with the early starting date of this barn of 1754. The house next to this barn has an identical truss, and the house was built in the 1760s. Here's a good side-by-side -side comparison. We see closest to us the asymmetrical gable end of a stone Schweitzer with its log four bay and a rather steep roof, about 40 degrees steep, steep roof. And beyond it is a shallower sloped roof with a taller four bay, four bay front wall. The date of that barn is 1837. So it's a rare side-by-side -side comparison of an early Schweitzer and a later standard barn. The date on the early barn, 1787, is shown on the lintel of the door above the threshing floor, built in the, built in the Ole Valley in that, at that date. Pennsylvania barns take on various forms, including this unusual form. The stone arches support the forebay, support the forebay front wall. A four bay or a stone front wall on a bank barn is usually typical of English bank barn construction in, in the Lake District of England, but this was in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. 
And apparently, the farmer wanted to have a four bay and a stone front wall. The only way to resolve the problem is to have stone arches to support the very heavy weight of the four bay front wall. So we have a stone, a, a stone arch four bay barn built in 1810, showing a connection between English technology and Germanic technology. This barn used to belong to me in Bucks, Berks County, Pennsylvania. It is a large extension of a four bay supported by posts. That was an add-on four bay built on around 1900 as a large straw shed to accommodate the straw that could be blown in when machine threshing became the rule. Throughout much of eastern Pennsylvania, many earlier barns have been extended to the front. They are front extension barns to be made larger as technology increased the yields. So barns can be extended to the front and be made larger. The idea of where these barns came from, again, is one of the problems we want to solve today. And uh, many scholars, as I have pointed out, mentioned the fact that uh, the barns came out of Pennsylvania and were invented there by evolution. Other people have suggested there may be European connections, which is rather, rather obvious since the Germanic settlers came out of Switzerland and the Palatinate region of Germany to Pennsylvania. Here I have a picture of a nice scalloped bench, which you see in the foreground. Benches like that can be found all over the Pennsylvania German country in southeastern Pennsylvania. However, that bench was photographed at a farmstead in the Pfalz in Germany. Another connection, the German connection, is the form of this blanket chest, known as a dower chest, common in Pennsylvania from the middle and later 1700s on as this Berks County example shows. That was made around 1810, and I bought it at a sale in Berks County. It dates back to its prototype, the European Germanic Alpine decorated chest. This one is a Bavarian chest, which you see in a museum in southern Germany. Other European connections in architecture would be exemplified by the steep roofs and the shed dormers of the famous cloisters in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Some of these buildings were built as early as the 1730s, and they housed a religious sect that lived there for the next hundred years. Another example of European Germanic influence is in York County, Pennsylvania, the city of York, the famous Golden Plow Tavern, which has log construction below, half timbered or Fachtwerk construction above, and was built in 1741. It's one of the few log, log and half-timber buildings found in the United States. Did any barns at all come from Europe to Pennsylvania or Europe to America? Well, we're back in Europe or northern Holland here. Here's a typical Holland Dutch barn, which you see is built in the ground level, but, but is accessed from the gable end. Actually, there are three doors there a central door leading down the center aisle, and doors on either side which access the animals which are stabled in the barn facing the center aisle, a typical Dutch configuration. And although you can't see it on the picture, the front end of this barn is a house. It's a house barn connect con combination, a nine height house, a single function house, typical of many parts of Europe where space was important and room had to be saved. We're looking at a picture of the inside of a very early Dutch barn in Holland, and here you can see the massive beams called anchor beams across the top of the thresh, threshing floor with a nice uh, scallop braces. That configuration is typical of the Dutch barns that are found from Saxony and northern Germany right across through northern Holland. Here's an example of nearly the same configuration, but this is, is northern New Jersey. It's a Dutch-American barn, or, a, or New World Dutch barn. We have the three doors on the end, including the central threshing floor door. And if we go inside that barn, we can see the anchor beam and the brace. The difference is that the, how the house was detached. When the Dutch came to the Hudson Valley and northern New Jersey, where there was plenty of room and no need to save space, they separated the house from the barn and built the barn separately. There may have been a few examples of combinations in the early history, but they cannot be proven. Now we're in northern France, and here's a French long barn, which you can see has double threshing floor doors, and then small windows at the end of the barn, including in indicating a stable is located there, 
and the other end of the barn probably has haymows, a French lawn barn common in parts of France. But the same form came to Quebec. This is in the St. Lawrence Valley, north of the city of Quebec. It's a French lawn barn, Quebec style, built in frame. The same double doors at the one end and stable windows at the close end, the near end of the barn. So barns did come intact without much change from Europe to America. We've seen two examples now. Well, obviously this, obviously this is a bank barn. Let's go around to the other side. We're back in Pennsylvania. This one has no forebay. And maybe, as we mentioned before, this is an example of an English Lake District bank barn which came from northwestern England to the Philadelphia Quaker counties during the 1700s and were replicated here and moved up into the Dutch country. So we have English Lake District bank barns which came intact from a European source region in north of England to Pennsylvania. In fact, let's look at one of these in England. Here's the bank of a bank barn in England in the Lake District. And if we go around to the front of that barn, instead of there being a four bay, we see a pent roof. So the English Lake District bank barn, sometimes with pent roof, did come to Pennsylvania intact and was duplicated and replicated all around the Philadelphia area. Also, you can notice here the nice barnyard wall in this picture. The barnyard wall, which is not found in European source regions, probably came out of England to Pennsylvania to the Philadelphia counties and moved upstate into the Dutch counties with, and joined the Pennsylvania barn to form its barnyard wall. This looks like a ground barn to me. In fact, it's a ground barn, a double log crib ground barn with a thatched roof. However, that one's in Transylvania in Romania and not in Pennsylvania. So the ground barn, again, is a very common early barn, simple barn found throughout many parts of Europe in many forms. Here's another ground barn, again, steep thatched roof uh, with that nice little uh, porch-like entrance. That's in the south of England. That's an English threshing barn. So English, in England, bar barns were built as ground-level barns. Uh, as well as the Lake District Bank Barn to the north of England. Most English barns are ground level barns, however. And if you go in this barn, we can see piles of hay and straw and a very tall, steep roof. And the roof post that you can see on the right hand side of the picture is kind of flared like a gun stock on the top. It's called a gun stock post head, and that supports the tie beam and supports the frame of the roof. That technology did come to Pennsylvania as well, and is found in other parts of Europe. But this barn built in the 1500s is a good example of an early English frame ground level threshing barn. The ground level English threshing barn came to the New World as well. This one is in Maine, down east. In fact, there's the coast out there. Again, we have a ground level barn central threshing floor with storage on either side. Now sometimes they put a stable on the one side as the window in this barn seems to indicate. But barns like this are found from southern New England right down to the Chesapeake Bay area in the areas of early English settlement. So that barn came to America without change. Here we see a half-timbered house, central chimney house, and a half-timbered ground barn. Looks almost like the ground barns in Pennsylvania, excepting that we didn't build half-timbered barns very often in Pennsylvania. This is in the Eiffel Upland in the museum, and it shows a Germanic Rhine Valley Palatinate-type ground barn with a central threshing floor and a stable on either side. This is the source of the early ground barn that came to Pennsylvania as the pioneer barn before other barns were developed. So let's go to Europe and check things out in more detail. I've disputed the idea of the fact that the Four Bay Bank barn evolved there. They were there very early, soon after the ground barn. So maybe if we travel across appropriate parts of Europe, we'll be able to find some European prototypes for a Pennsylvania Four Bay Bank barn. We're going to start in Lower Saxony in the north of this map and travel down the Rhine Valley to Baden-Württemberg and Alsace. We're going to go to France and the Tyrol and Austria and then come back to Switzerland and see what we can find. Starting in Saxony in northern Germany is a typical German-Saxon Dutch-type barn with a gable access and central uh, 
highway going down the barn. This is what we would expect in that part of Northern Europe, on the Northern European Plain. We come down the Rhine Valley, and here we're observing the terraces of the Rhine Valley in Alsace, which was a Germanic province of what is now in France. And here's our farmstead. I'm looking for farms. I'm not seeing them immediately. The reason being, as you probably well know, is that this is a medieval European feudal open field system still surviving, where the farmers all live in the village with their houses and barns in a compact setting and go out every day to strips of fields surrounding the village, a very inefficient system, but one that's difficult to change and is still surviving in many parts of Europe, as we can see here. We are in one of those European farming villages, and here we see a good assemblage of European half-timbered architecture. This is in the German village on the border with Switzerland. We see steep Germanic roofs with tile construction. We see central chimneys. We see half-timber construction. We see little pet roofs across the gable end. And in the distance along the village street is a, is a small ground barn. So houses and barns were in the village. There were no barnyards. There wasn't a lot of room. Things were compact. And the fields then surrounded the village. This nice structure is a little bit tricky because it has an, looks like a four bay, except it's open. Uh, these balconies are common in Germanic construction. This is in the Rhine Valley, again, in Alsace, in the village of Kaiserberg, where Albert Schweitzer was born. And we have an open balcony called a lava, and that was used for drying and for, for recreation. And many buildings in Germany and Switzerland have an open balcony, or Laube, as it's called, as part of their house construction. I went to the village of Lorenzen looking for ancestors. I realized that my own ancestors came out of this village. And uh, I thought, well, maybe we can find a barn that looks pretty interesting there. And lo and behold, we found this strange-looking barn, stone one with this with four bay-like contraption sticking on the end, and I thought, Eureka, maybe we have found it. After all, the Pennsylvania Germans did come through the Palatinum on the way to Pennsylvania before they left Switzerland in many cases. Down the street was another interesting structure in which there was a, an overhanging storage unit, which at first looked like a four bay, but on closer examination we find that that is not the case. We have here a ground barn, which you would expect to find in the Palatinate, with a deep overhanging roof called the Vordach. And under the Vordach, they framed out a space or a compartment for storage and supported it with posts. It looks like a posted forebay, but it was added on later. So actually, it was a falsy. It was a false forebay. Although I didn't find a Pennsylvania barn in this village, I did find some Ensmingers and met up with them and had a free meal with some of my relatives from way back in Europe. Typically in the Palatinate and, and uh, adjoining Alsace are small ground barns built in compact situations. Here we have the ground barn squeezed in between two houses. And as you go up and down the city street, there's house barn, house barn, alternating as you go down the street, which saves plenty of space. There's no barnyard wall there, there's no room for it. The cattle may be put in common pastures out behind the barn, up behind the village, next to the fields. And there's the manure pile, not only in front of the barn, but also in front of the kitchen door. Saving spaces can be convenient, but can also have its problems. A Germanic example, the same thing near Heidelberg, a string village of house barns alternating. This is now being gentrified into, into uh, residential housing, as you can see. At the edges of the Black Forest, one finds another form. We have the house and barn built at right angles to each other. The barn on the left-hand side is a ground barn. Again, we're finding ground barns in our Germanic source regions, but no true four bays. And next to the ground barn is an attached uh, central chimney Germanic house. And guess what that box is just outside the porch of the front door of the house? That is the manure pit which also serves to, to recycle the garbage from the house as well. So saving things is important to those of us of Germanic heritage. 
we're looking at the other end of the barn. Here we can see the, the threshing floor doors and then another wing kind of forming an L coming out from the barn. The total thing forming a U-shaped court. This is an example of the Frankish court. The Franks, an early Germanic tribe, Charlemagne was a Frank actually, built structures like compounds like these throughout the Palatinate, the Frankish court. But it had no four bay barns. It did consist of at least one ground barn and other additions. Baden-Württemberg, the Black Forest, one of the source regions for people who came to Pennsylvania, was the next place we're looking at. Scenery is nice, as you can see. The forests are black and dark because of the lack of reflect, reflection of light from the evergreen forests. So we have individual farmsteads and small villages. Let's look closer. Well, we're in the center of one of the villages here, and I see there's the village fountain and trough, and the village waif or child. Uh, there is a manure pile beyond, and right next to the manure pile is this tall building. The second floor has a window box and flowers. That's probably the kitchen. Below that is a wagon, and that's probably the stable. So we have a house barn built vertically, stable in the basement, house above, bedrooms above that. So my question is, what do you do on a hot summer day when there's downwind from the newer pile into those kitchen windows. We are now in the Black Forest uh, Park known as Gutak, an open-air museum where they have reconstructed or moved in or say many good examples of Black Forest farmsteads. This is the famous Volksbadenhof, built in the 1570s. And you can see the balconies or Laba, the Laban on the front. So the front of this building is the house part of the building, the very steep thatched roof. Let's look at the back of the building. Now we see the back of the Volksbadenhof. It's a banked structure. It looks like a huge ship docked against the side of the steep mountain of the Black Forest with a house in front, the barn in back, and the loft above. All through that top is a loft which goes over top of the house part and insulates it because it's filled with straw and hay. That structure also has a whole series of Germanic Liegenderstuhl roof trusses like we saw in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Another close-up of the bank bridge going to the upper part of Volksbarenhof and the stone section below that, the back of the house, is actually the stable part of the house. So it's a European Einheit house, a house barn of Black Forest type. In the area around the Black Forest are many bank structures we realize that bank structures and bank house barns are found all over Europe. This is a separate barn structure, bank in the rear, and if you go around to the front of the barn, we will see that instead of there being a four bay there, there's a, a four dock or a four roof, a long overhanging roof, which also protects the stable wall and does the same idea. And there's our ubiquitous manure pile right outside the stable wall. Even in the southern part of France, in the uplands of the southern French Massif, there are bank structures. This little house has a bank coming in the back, leading to a storage part for a barn above in the steep roof. So house barns and bank barns and bank structures are common in all hilly European alpine sections. Let's go even farther. We are now on the northern slopes of the Pyrenees Mountains. And what do we have here? a banked field barn for storing hay and, and housing cattle in the summer months when they're running the high pastures of this alpine setting. We're going to Switzerland and what do we have here? House barn connection. You can tell the house by the wash line it must be Monday and jutting out to the left is the barn connection. It's a ground barn. So we're finding ground barns and house barns but no four bay barns. So thus far, although we are in the Germanic sections of Europe, we have not found any good prototypes for our Pennsylvania barn. We've just got to keep on looking. Not far away in the village of Ottenbach is another house-barn combination. In this one, the house and the barn are built along the long axis, and the, the overhanging water dock, which you can see here, connects between the house and the barn and, and articulates the two buildings. And you can see that brace is holding up the purlin, which holds up the overhanging roof. 
That perlin is called the Flugfetten, or a flying perlin in German, and it protects the facade of the building, of both buildings. You can see the threshing floor, big doors adjacent to the house. You can see a small door with a barrel that's leading into the stable, but it also tells you that, as is true of many Swiss barns, there is a room in the barn for the processing of wine, and there's a wine room in that barn where wine is made and stored. Above the barrel is a large opening with a, a lifting device to lift the hay and straw up to the loft of the barn. This is a two-level barn, but it is not a bank barn. This is the so-called level part of Switzerland, the northern plateau, not too far from Luzern and Zurich. Beautiful rolling country, mixed farmsteads and, and small villages. Let's check this out and see if we can find any of our forebays. A close-up shows a nice Swiss uh, folk house. The front of it has the laba, that's the living dwelling, the living part. The back part of it is the barn part, and there's a huge covered bridge leading into the side, leading into the upper part of the barn. A section called Amantau in Canton Baron, the region from which Jacob Amon and the Amish came from Switzerland to the Palatinate before they came to Pennsylvania. That might be the logical place to look for Pennsylvania-type barns. The landscape is rich and open, as you can see in the picture here. Here's a close-up of an Amantau farmstead. And again, we have our side lab or balcony and our overhanging roof, which seems to be typical of this Germanic architecture. We're around the other side of the barn house, and we're looking up toward the laba, which is on the house end of the barn, and there's our stairway into the laba, almost like a stairway into the forebay. Uh, closer to us is the, bo the door leading into the stable part of the barn, and the uh, upper part is a part of the barn bridge leading to the loft of the barn. We are in the loft of that structure. You can see it's a rather deep loft. You can come in from the side and then go up and down along the barn, and you can actually unload down and fill a middle section. This is a double-decker or a three-level barn, which has a huge capacity to keep enough hay and straw throughout the winter to feed the cattle. One of the few outbuildings on Swiss farmsteads is this one called a spiker or storage building. This is a log plank, a squared log, pl log plank building with overhanging balconies or lava. We're finding those, although we're not finding four bays, and the steep roof with its, which is tiled. From the front of that building you can see you can access it by a series of stairways. And Mr. Amon, the name of the man in the foreground there, is going to take us into his barn into his storage building. This is his wife, and she looks like a typical Swiss Pennsylvania German type lady. She's opening a door to the second floor of the Speicher, and we're going to look in there. And there, lo and behold, we have the grain bins. You can see the hand plain wood that's used. This building was built in the 1790s. And up on a shelf behind the grain bin is a rye straw beehive, just like the kind that came to Pennsylvania. So we've been through France and Switzerland, the Palatinate, the Black Forest. We haven't found any true four bays. Let's travel farther to the east and go to the Tyrol of Austria. Here's a Tyrolean folk house, or folk house barn. Magnificent structure, big structure, with wraparound lauben or balconies in the front. But lo and behold, to the rear is an overhanging projection section projecting section of the barn. It looks somewhat like a four-bay form. Let's close up on that. Here we see a close up of the same type thing. There's a bank to the rear of this building leading into the barn. So it's a large Tyrolean folk house, house barn, with an overhanging four-bay-like bay for extra storage. And there's our double Dutch German Germanic door like we see in Pennsylvania as well, below that overhanging bay leading into the stable, and there are the cattle, and there's the manure pile, as usual. A little farther to the east, in Zillertal, a province of Austria, is a four-bay barn with a bank connected to a house. So here's the first building, which is somewhat similar to Pennsylvania structures. Shallow four-bay bank in the back, but it's connected directly to the house. And if you even travel south, through Carinthia, the southern province of Austria, you find 
four bay-like structures on some buildings. So things are looking up as we search for our four bay bank bar. And this has a multiple overhang gable end and side and overhanging bay. And even in the northern Slo Yugoslavia, or Slovenia as it's known, the Germanic province of northern Yugoslavia, is this four bay barn with a stairway going into the four bay behind the house and separate from the house. So far the closest thing we've found anything in Pennsylvania. Uh, the building behind is a steeple of the church that has nothing to do with the barn, although it looks like it's connected to it. This part of Slovenia was settled by Germanic peoples uh, about a thousand years ago. Well, we better return to Switzerland and see if we can do any better. We've been getting a little closer. This is a photograph of my wife's great-grandfather standing under the four bays of several barns somewhere in Switzerland. The photograph is taken around 1900. Nobody knows where it was taken, but we have, we, that means we're going to go back to Switzerland and look a little closer. In the Toggenberg region, which is east of Luzern, and we're going to find that there are many examples of little ground barns with four bays. We now find four bay ground barns. Of course, we saw some of those in Pennsylvania. There may be a connection, but I rather doubt that. But these are very common in that region of eastern Switzerland. But here's a close-up of a four-bay ground barn in, Bird, in Bob's Creek Valley in Bedford County, Pennsylvania. Almost exactly the same thing with a split-type four-bay. So there seems to be a connection architecturally between those ground barns in Switzerland and these in Pennsylvania, but it's never been clearly uh, researched. It's interesting, nevertheless. Things are looking better. This is maybe my first true ground barn with a true four bay in Switzerland, in a remote valley near Glarus in Switzerland, in eastern Switzerland. The gable end on the opposite end has the bank leading into the barn. You can see a cantilever four bay and log construction. And the back of that building is an add-on frame. That should be really removed. That was added later. If we keep this building and remove the back part, we have a, an asymmetrical gable and looking almost like the log Schweitzers in early Pennsylvania. So there's a very strong connection here. Well, things kind of change every so often. And what do we have here? I see the four bay there, the overhanging the overhanging bay, the threshing floor doors, the beams which support the four bay, which if you notice are nicely squared and shaped. That's just for nice. It looks good. The double dutch door, but, and the stairway into the four bay, but the bank coming into the four bay. Here's a bank in the four bay barn, which is rare and unusual. There are about five of these in a small village called Buchs on the Liechtenstein border in eastern Switzerland. Lo and behold, we have a few in Pennsylvania. Here's a bank bridge into the four bay of a barn near State College, Pennsylvania. And there are about seven of these down in Bucks County, eastern Pennsylvania. Connection or not, I'm not sure, but we can find examples of everything in Pennsylvania back in Switzerland in some location. A distant view of this nice bank structure, a typical barn with a nice bank, a red tile roof. Let's go around the front of the building and see what we have. And sure enough, it's a four bay. So we have four bay, true four bay bag barns, separate from houses, found in central and eastern Switzerland. This is in a region called Entenbuch, which is south of Luzerne. Not far away is this massive building, a barn building. It not only has a four bay, it has a lab or balcony above the four bay. And behind you, you can see there are, it's a double bank structure. There are two banks leading into this large barn. And they lead to a level that seems to be higher than the top of the stable wall below because this is a double-decker barn. Let's go in that barn. We come in the bank of this barn, and we're raising up to a third level, which means this barn can be downloaded from a threshing bridge or a bridge across the barn and has huge capacity this way. So this large, 110-foot-long, double-decker, four-bay, and lava bank barn was a dairy barn in, in Switzerland. We are now in the four bay part of the barn. We cross the threshing bridge and you can see, you can see that it's large enough for storage of a wagon in the distance. 
that barn would fit right into Pennsylvania. Nice looking barn with a four bay and support post. Our nice manicured meatloaf like manure pile out in front of the barn. And uh, it's not Switzerland, it's not Pennsylvania, it is in Switzerland because you see the window boxes along the side of the bar. Now we do that in Switzerland but not in Pennsylvania. There's also a red tile roof in that barn and Pennsylvania barns do not have red tile roofs. So this is an example of a barn in the canton of Schwitz in central Switzerland, south of Luzerne. And there are several thousand barns like this in that canton. So some of the early scholars who looked at Pennsylvania barns and said there are no such examples anywhere in Switzerland just hadn't looked hard enough because they are here by the thousands. Another example in Canton Schwitz of the same kind of barn with a steep roof of red tile and this is not Pennsylvania because of the gable pent that you see. Gable pents are found on barns in Switzerland and on houses in Pennsylvania but not on barns in Pennsylvania. Another example in the same region of a steep roof with a log construction behind the frame and a nice four bay supported by posts in Canton Schwitz. This also has log cribs forming the interior part of the barn. Here we see without covering the log crib side of the barn the four bay posted four bay on a hillside in above Lake Luzerne in Switzerland. And on this shot, in the distance, not, we not only see a snow-capped mountain, which definitely rules out Pennsylvania, but a posted four-bay barn at the base of the mountain. So how did these barns develop and how did they come there into this part of Switzerland? We're looking at a village in the valley, a Romance village in Canton Grabinden in eastern Switzerland, where masonry construction is the rule. The Romance moved into this part of Switzerland probably before Roman times and were Romanized by, Ger by Roman connection and spoke a Romance Roman type language, a Latin type language which they speak today in that part of Switzerland. The upper slopes of, the, of this region were not inhabited in the 12 and 1300s. The local lords invited in another Germanic group called the Walsers, the Walser Deutsch, who had moved to the Rhone Valley out of Germany and were then spreading to the east and the west. They invited them in to settle the uplands to increase the population to serve as mercenaries and they were given the land at and above Timberline, above villages like this. The Romans did the farming. The Walsers living on the high meadows did the, the, the cattle raising, but they also used the nearby forest to build things and logs. So they built log houses, log barns, and up there you see several log barns, including one with a gable four bay, or four tube. They also built unusual log granary storage buildings. This one also has an overhanging upper section called a four tube. The people in the area, if they did try to raise grain, had to pick it green and dry it on these grain racks, known as a chigne. The chisne is a romance term which goes back maybe a thousand years, but the bundles of grain were cut green, the growing season was too short for drying the fields, they were tied on these scaffolds and allowed to dry in the, in the sun and the wind. Eventually the chisne was applied to the side of a barn, maybe by the Walsers, maybe by the romance, we don't know, but here we see a, a barn with a stable below, a bank at the back, and an open chisne attached to the side of the barn, front and side. That's called a talina, an open talina. It's like an open forebay. I've been told by people who live here that in the olden days they carried the grain sheaves up the ramp in back of the barn, through the barn, out a small door in the front here, and then they were handed out and tied in sheaves on the rack of the talina. A high walls or village called Supine, above Timberline at about 5,000 feet. See the snow line, the Timberline, and off in the distance is a shaded section below that little barn. It looks like a four bay. We'll get up closer and see that as we enter the village. The village is a very old village with a house dated 1586. The Walsers were there a long time. Also, the Walsers 
decorated the eaves of the house with, with geometric designs, almost like the barn stars of Hexides in Pennsylvania. So maybe there is a connection between decorative buildings in Switzerland and decorative barns in Pennsylvania. We're up close to that small barn we saw from a distance, and sure enough, there's a little overhanging four bay, a side bridge to get into the upper level, and a small stable below, a very old Walzer type four bay bank barn in this region of eastern Switzerland in Canton Grabinden. Inside the stable are maybe five or six cows, maybe eight or ten. In the olden times, the cows were milked, and the milk was preserved by baking it into butter or cheese which could be stored. Today it's transported out of the area to dairies in the valley. Farmers like this could not make a living were it not for them, the fact that they're being subsidized by the Swiss government to maintain the villages, to maintain the meadows, which grow the wildflowers, and attract the tourists. Otherwise, brush and forest would overtake and the beauty would be gone. So while in America we subsidize the big farmer, in Europe they subsidize the small farmer and preserve the ecology and the landscape. This map of eastern Switzerland showing Germany to the north and Austria to the east and Italy to the south is mainly in Canton Grabinden. And all the shaded areas are areas in which four bay bank barns can be found, various types can be found. And as you can see, it's a large area of Switzerland involving possibly tens of thousands of four bay bank barns. So there are four bay bank barns in Switzerland going back many years. And if we look a little farther, we might, we might be able to find a real close prototype of the Pennsylvania barn. In fact, we're going to go to this valley known as Prattigau in the easternmost part of Canton, Canton Grabinden in early summer when the apple blossoms are blooming and there are hundreds of farmsteads on the valley sides and almost every farmstead has a log crib four bay bank barn. As we see in this picture here, bank or built into a bank on the back Four bay over the front, log crib construction. We're looking at the four bay end of another one, and here we see the stairway going into the four bay. This is a frame four bay on a log crib barn, very much like the early log spicers in Pennsylvania. Barns like this do date back to the 1600s. Another example of a frame four bay on a log crib barn, this has support posts. And all of these are taken within a small distance within this valley, the Landquart Valley, known as Prattigau in easternmost Canton Grabinden in Switzerland. A close-up of the stable wall with the stable doors, split doors, and a stairway going up into the forebay. And old literature suggests that the forebay was used for storage of all kinds of things, including tools and grains, like the forebay in Pennsylvania frequently had a granary. We are inside the threshing floor of one of those barns and we see the loading opening of the log crib. The technology is the same as we find in Pennsylvania. So it would appear from these barns, which date back possibly to the late 1500s, that there were prototypes of four bay bank barns in early eastern Switzerland built by Walser people, which are practically identical to the earliest log spikes of barns I've came to Pennsylvania. And here we have one final shot of the hillside overlooking Prattingau. And here's a log crib four bay bank barn, snow cut peaks in the distance. So here's the story of the Pennsylvania barn. We've now gone from eastern Switzerland to the western part of the United States, 7,000 miles, and from the 1500s to the 21st century, over 500 years in the story of the Pennsylvania barn. All of us at the Heritage Center are grateful for Bob's many significant contributions to the culture of the region, but especially the intellectual generosity and eagerness with which he encouraged new generations of barn enthusiasts throughout the Commonwealth. He inspired the creation of the Historic Barn and Farm Foundation of Pennsylvania, of which he was a founding member of the Board of Directors and served on the advisory committee up until the time of his passing. 
Bob was not a gatekeeper, but a true torch bearer who shared his light with others to keep the fire burning. Today, countless barn enthusiasts continue Bob's legacy in Pennsylvania and throughout the United States, helping us all to recognize the significance of the Pennsylvania barn as a cultural icon worthy of preservation. <laughs> Thanks for watching, but don't go away. Coming up next, join harpist, composer, and author Sarah Jane Williams of McCungy for some musical celebrations of the coming of spring. Cultural programming for this virtual celebration of Easter on the Farm 2021 is brought to you by the Pennsylvania German Cultural Heritage Center at Kutztown University, the hub of Pennsylvania German culture and language. Visit us online at www.kutztown.edu backslash pgchc. Thank you to all of our viewers, supporters, and friends. Mir zu alle unser Guka, ohne Schlitze und Freund. Max gut.